very warm welcome, please, to one of my heroes, one of the finest men that has ever represented this country in the European Parliament, Stuart Agnew, MEP. Right, well, I've got to have to start with a complaint. You've spelled R, ah, you've got it right now, and you've got it wrong there. That's correct, S-T-U-A-R-T, -T, so don't let's get it wrong. Now, I'll try not to wear these, they're my spare pair, but they make me look like a sinister criminal. I'll try without. I want to direct my opening remarks specifically to those of you who are UKIP PPCs in rural areas and have been asked to attend NFU hustings for all candidates. And it's extremely difficult for many of you who know nothing about farming and find yourselves up against other candidates who might do, and of course farmers who expect you to know everything about farming. I am trying to support you as best as I can uh, by going around the country myself, but I've also, in the last 10 days, sent out three different communications. Lisa Burton, my PA, has done this to all the ROs in the country. I'm hoping that these communications are trickling through. If you are a rural candidate and you haven't had anything from me, please come and see me and I will put it right because it's important I back you up as well as I possibly can. Because after all, we don't get groups of accountants insisting on having hustings in a particular constituency for people to come and talk about complicated tax matters or the medical profession wanting to talk about drugs and how the, the, the local practices are organized. Unfortunately for you, the farming unions take these elections very, very seriously and they have these hustings and I take my hat off to all those PPCs who are going to go to these hustings and they don't know that much about agriculture. Thank you very much indeed. Please give them a hand. <laughs> right, thank you. I just want a quick note on the devolved assemblies. I've spoken to the chairman about this. The policy that I've produced uh, applies to England. It would be the default policy for Wales and Scotland, but the Welsh and the Scottish assemblies would have the authority to change that w within the budget that they got, but they must adhere to WTO rules. Now, there are elections in Scotland and Wales next year, and although Steve doesn't know this, I've got somebody who can help with uh, tweaking these agricultural policies for these upland areas. Now, I'll be giving you his CV in time, Steve, but I can recommend him, and I think that this will help in those areas. Right, now the chairman said to me, Agus, don't just go through your policies. You're not talking to a group of farmers. I want something different. I want you to talk about food security. And at first, of course, the old resistance factor came in, and I wanted to be in my comfort zone. But I think he's right. We want to just look at this from a different, a different way altogether. So, I want you to imagine that you've woken up one morning to the following news bulletin. That the Channel Tunnel has, ha, has been exploded and won't be in use for a very long time. <laughs> Didn't expect a clap on that. That the 60,000 tonne cargo boat with soya beans about to unload in Southampton water has been sunk. And that an air freighter uh, with imported fresh fruit from the Southern Hemisphere in a, a, landed at Heathrow was hit by a handheld Samus Stingray missile, whatever you call it, as it landed. And there are terrorists making demands, and they hope to starve us out. And our government quite rightly says, we are not going to negotiate with terrorists. So the immediate question is, will we be able to feed ourselves? And I want to answer that question in two different time zones. One is now, and one is in 10 years' time. And the answer is very, very different. Where are we now as regards food production? Our farmers produce 60% of the food that's eaten in this country, but that statistic isn't quite as frightening as it sounds because we do export a lot of food as well. So if you net the two off, we are about 80% self-sufficient. And that figure isn't as frightening as it sounds because of the way it's made up, and I will go into that. So what would it be like two days into the terrorist event? You will notice particularly in the wintertime, fresh fruit and vegetables vanishing off the supermarket shelves. We have got used to it now, being able to walk into a supermarket at any time of year and being able to find fresh produce there in, in season somewhere. Uh, 
and we're fussy about, oh, that one's got a spot on it, I won't have that. That one's not fully spherical, I won't have that. We've become very spoiled. Well, that will go. We are going to have to live, learn to live without the fresh fruit and vegetables. We will have to do what we always do, and that's enjoy British produce when it's in season. The next thing we would notice was that the rice supply would dry up. When I was a little boy, there was very little rice eaten in the country, but now it's slowly supplanted potatoes. But of course, it's all imported, and so we would see that disappear. Why not get back into our gardens, into our allotments, and plant a few potatoes? We could get around that one, I'm pretty sure. We would see no more red wheat from, from Canada being imported into the country, hard red wheat. That is the type of wheat we need in order for our loaves of bread to stay fresh for three or four days. However, we won't get that, but what we have got, and I want to keep you to keep this figure in the forefront of your minds, we export four million tons of soft wheat from this country. We produce a surplus of soft wheat every year, every year. it varies, but let's call it four million tons. We can withhold that, we don't have to export that. That will be our staff of life. Please remember it, because I'm going to keep referring to it. Yes, it won't make the traditional loaf of bread, but it will make a croissant, it will make a roll, and we're going to have to get used to eating those, but that isn't really such a sacrifice. The next thing we would notice is the lack of protein for animal feed. That 60,000 tons of soya beans is one of many cargoes that comes here. Our animals aren't going to die as a result of not having that extra protein in their diets, but they won't produce as much as they're capable of. So there will be less milk and milk products, and there will be uh, less eggs. But remember, the four million tons of wheat is there still. We will have to change our drinking habits. Instead of drinking wine, we're going to have to resort to whiskey and beer. Now, for some people, that will be, <laughs> that will be a hardship. For others, it won't involve any change of habits at all. And we're also going to have to substitute uh, lamb for pork. We export a lot of lamb. We import quite a bit of pork. Well, they will very roughly balance off. So overall, I think with a bit of British grit, we could face these frightful terrorists down. They would not get the better of us if this happened now. We would see it out, and in the end, they would give up, and we wouldn't give way to a single demand they have. Right. Now let's for fast forward, say, 10 years, and the situation will be very, very different there because of five different pieces of EU legislation, all of which are serving to undermine agricultural production in this country. And I haven't prioritized them, and I will simply start with the new way of registering and testing pesticides. Now, we do need these materials to grow that four million tons of wheat I keep talking about. We need to stop weeds overwhelming our crops. We need to stop them being plastered with fungus. We need to stop them being inundated with insects that pump virus diseases into them. We have to stop this happening, and we need pesticides to do it. If the EU has its way, we are gonna lose half of our active ingredients, and that means we will not be able to contribute to that four million tons of wheat. It's gonna be a big problem for us. It won't just be on cereals, it will be on vegetables. So I talked about uh, being able to grow in-season vegetables and being able to eat them. Well, we won't be able to grow them properly because they won't be able to compete against vegetables imported from other countries that are allowed to use these pesticides. So we're going to lose a food production base there. Then, of course, we have got this extraordinary idea from the European Union that says that British farmers, by the way they farm, can change the world's weather. This is the thought process, and this is what farmers have got to deal with. What are farmers doing wrong? They're producing CO2 and they're producing methane. Now, I went along to a meeting in Brussels where they told us how farmers could produce less CO2 and less methane. In the case of CO2, they showed a picture of a tractor pulling a plough. But there was a slight variation. The exhaust pipe of that tractor was extended into a, a flexible steel hose that went over the roof of the tractor, back down, and into the bowels of the plough, down so that the soil as it was being turned over was burying the exhaust fumes. Now, if you're a farmer, <laughs> you will know that if you put hot air into cold ground, there's only one thing that will happen, it will start to come bubble out again. That's all that will happen. But crucially, the effort involved in pumping all that stuff down under the ground like that 
will increase fuel consumption. More carbon dioxide, so you're getting absolutely nowhere. But the MEPs in that committee room all clapped like that. Well, wasn't that a good idea? This one didn't clap. <laughs> then they went on. So what will happen on the ground? They will, it will mean they will have to use their tractors a bit less, which means they won't be able to cultivate as much as they would like, which means that 4 million tonnes will shrink a little bit further. Now we go on to methane. Methane is produced by ruminants. Ruminants are not a sudden product of farming. Ruminants existed thousands and thousands of years ago in millions of numbers across this planet, and they all emitted methane. However, once they're domesticated, they become a serious hazard to global warming, apparently, and the farmers <laughs> must do something about it. They must reduce methane emissions. Now, we, again, we had another little lecture in the Parliament how that was going to happen. Oh, you must feed your, uh, your cattle and your sheep. Less grass, less hay, less silage, more cereals and concentrates. If you know anything about feeding ruminants, you cannot feed them profitably on such concentrated rations. They are inefficient converters. They eat grass. We don't eat grass, but they eat grass and convert it into food and products that we can eat. So they do a good job eating grass, but of course it makes them do what ruminants do. So just imagine a scenario. There's, an uh, there's a farmer who's been told he's one, one of the one in 100 who's going to have an inspection. But he's even more unlucky. He's going to have an inspection while the EU are going to have their one in 10,000 inspectors of the inspectors, if you follow what I mean. So you have the officious man from the EU uh, inspecting the British inspector who's inspecting the British farmer. Meanwhile, somebody's got to be doing a work on the farm and they're having a look in the cattle sheds. And the officious EU inspector is strutting down the cattle lines with his methane meter, and the farmer is standing there in the corner with his fingers crossed and his eyes closed saying, Daisy, Daisy, please don't fart. <laughs> well, of course he does, and all hell lets loose, and he's penalised, and he loses his subsidy, and all the rest of it. What can he do to avoid all that? He's got to have fewer cattle, so that's going to under undermine our productive base in that sector as well. Then we've got the NVZs, the nitrate vulnerable zones. Now I and very many other farmers in East Anglia and the East Midlands are considered to be effectively trading illegally in as much as that the, the soil water in our soil, in our subsoil, in our groundwater, by the EU definition contains too much nitrogen in it. Too much. They say that once it's over 50 milliliters, uh, 50 milligrams in a litre, you are breaking the law. Our old British law, when we actually could run things, said 100. And in these parts of the world, uh, East Anglia and the East Midlands, we just cannot get it down. Now, they're slowly turning the screw on us. All the time, they're making it more and more difficult for us to fertilize our crops. And a study was done a number of years ago. What would we actually have to do to really satisfy the EU? And the answer came back, you will have to set aside half of your arable land in East Anglia as ungrazed set aside and some in the East Midlands. Imagine the impact that is going to have on that 4 million tonnes of wheat. It's going to be massive. But it doesn't end there, of course, does it? We've got to get involved in renewable energy, and you'll have heard something about that this morning. And I'm sure all of you will have noticed over the last six months that literally thousands of acres of solar farms that are just erupting across our landscape. They're just appearing from nowhere. Every time you see a new one of those, that's 25 years minimum that the land underneath that cannot grow wheat. Think about the pile of 4 million tonnes. But it doesn't just end at solar panels. They're these aerobic digesters, which in themselves don't take up a great deal of space. But what you may not realise is that each of them needs between 1,000 and 1,500 acres of maize grown specially to feed it so our electricity consumers can pay far more for electricity than they need to. That maize should be growing, contributing to the 4 million tonnes of wheat, and of course it can't because it's going into the anaerobic digestion. So I hope you're beginning to get the idea that that 4 million tonnes is beginning to look a pretty miserable little heap now. Finally, on the livestock side, we're going into these Mercosur talks, or the TITP arrangement. Both of them are going to have a big impact on our beef industry. We are not going to be able to compete 
with Brazilian feedlots. Simple. We just won't be able to do it, and so that's more food we're going to have to import. Now, if you add up all of that together, I think you will agree that there probably isn't much left of that 4 million tons and the meat and the milk and all the rest of it. We simply won't be able to feed ourselves. But that's not the end of it, because in 10 years' time, if we look at the way the immigration numbers are going, we could have another 3 million more people to feed. And the terrorists will know it. They will know that we simply cannot resist them. We will buckle to their demands, and they can make those demands again and again and again. So it is absolutely crucial that we regain control of our agriculture, we regain control of our so that we cannot be pushed about in this way. Thank you very much.